Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave, connecting you to the leaders and pioneers of the psychedelic renaissance. My name is Paul F. Austin, and today I am speaking with chemist, journalist, and celebrity documentarian Hamilton Morris. These neuroscientific frameworks for conceptualizing the action of drugs are almost like personal mythologies that they create that have nothing to do with neuroscience. Like it, there's this kind of strange way of talking about it that has, if anything, just increased my appreciation of Alexander Shulgin and how much emphasis he put on the value of experience. As did Terence McKenna, the supreme value of direct experience as the ultimate measure and the most sophisticated high resolution tool for the analysis of these drugs. Welcome to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave, audio mycelium connecting you to the luminaries and thought leaders of the psychedelic renaissance. We bring you illuminating conversations with scientists, therapists, entrepreneurs, coaches, doctors, and shamanic practitioners exploring how we can best use psychedelic medicine to accelerate personal healing, peak performance, and collective transformation. Welcome back, listeners. This is Paul F. Austin, founder and CEO at Third Wave, and today I'm thrilled to bring you a conversation with the one and only Hamilton Morris, the psychedelic chemist and researcher who's best known for his docu-series Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, released by Vice TV. By the way, if you haven't watched any of his episodes, you're in for a real treat. It's a fascinating exploration into various psychoactive substances and the science and lore behind them. Hamilton and I had a chance to connect in person at the 2023 Wonderland Conference in Miami. Our conversation begins with a deep dive into the scientific and historical perspectives of some lesser-known compounds like bufotenine and silamethoxin, unraveling the intriguing history around silamethoxin, including Hamilton's own experience with this interesting compound. Hamilton also guides us through the nuanced world of psychoactive substances, drawing from his extensive background as a psychedelic chemist to offer insights that go beyond the mainstream narrative. Along the way, we confront the limitations of reductionist approaches to understanding psychedelics and dive deep into the subjective experiences that these substances offer. Hamilton also shares some profound takeaways from his work producing Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, and we navigate the complex terrain of psychedelic journalism, discussing the challenges of maintaining a balanced perspective in a rapidly evolving field. This episode is a rich and nuanced conversation on psychedelics, drawing from the insights of legends like Alexander Shulgin, Terence McKenna, and many others who have paved the way for us as a culture to have a deeper understanding of the psychedelic experience. I hope you enjoy the episode. I'm sure you will. But before we dive in, a quick reminder to follow the Psychedelic Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you haven't yet, you can help more people find this show by leaving a review. It's a simple and small action that only takes a minute, but it goes a long way in helping us to amplify psychedelic awareness, shifting the cultural conversation around these important medicines. All right, that's it for now. I hope you enjoy my conversation today with Hamilton Morris. All right, tell us about psilomethoxin. I heard you got some psilomethoxin sent to your lab and did some things in it. What's what's going on with psilomethoxin, Hamilton? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's interesting. It's sort of sad, I think, what happened, where, I mean, you know about the background on it. Um, actually, Symposia wrote some good articles about it i thought they they did like a very thorough dissection of the of the matter that um listeners can check out if they're curious but um i was interested in this for a while because there was this german mycologist and chemist named Joschen gartz mm -hmm. and he published a lot of these seminal papers on the chemistry of psilocybin containing mushrooms that especially at that time, were very unusual. Um, a lot of basic work on the 
presence or absence of various tryptamines and different species, but also he was interested in how the substrate that mushrooms are growing on can alter the chemical composition of the fungus. And so, I mean, an obvious example would be the presence of tryptophan is the necessary biosynthetic precursor for all of these tryptamines. So his, I believe, first contribution to this area was, well, what if you increase tryptophan? If you have a higher tryptophan substrate, does that result in mushrooms that have a higher concentration of psilocin or psilocybin? And I believe it did. And then he took it a step further and said, okay, well, why don't we cut out one of these steps of the biosynthesis and just introduce tryptamine so that there doesn't need to be any enzymatic decarboxylation of the tryptophan. And not only did it work according to his results, he detected the highest concentration of psilocin ever found in psilocybe cubensis. I think it was um, at least 2.3% and maybe even higher. Um, so really extraordinary. And then from there, I, and I think I'm getting the chronology of this right, but it's possible things were happening in a slightly different order. He decided to take it another step and thought, okay, if you can directly modulate the levels of tryptamines present in the fungus by adding these chemicals to the substrate, what happens if you add a completely synthetic material that is not found in nature, like DET? What's DET? Diethyltryptamine, a now incredibly obscure psychedelic that at one time was actually one of few psychedelics that were available in the 1960s because you know nobody was extracting nobody who wasn't indigenous was extracting dmt from plants and when i say extract i'm using the loose definition where a tea would be considered an extraction but nobody was you know doing mimosa hostilis root bark extractions in the 1960s if anybody tried dmt it was because they were synthesizing it and if you're synthesizing dmt you can make anything else with the same synthetic root, any other dialkyl tryptamine, if you want to make DET, you substitute diethylamine for dimethylamine. It's actually easier to handle because dimethylamine is a gas. It has to be transported in cylinders, whereas diethylamine is a liquid at room temperature. So it's a little bit, I mean, it's not hard to bubble dimethylamine through the reaction mix. I've done it many times, but this is a little bit easier. So for them, they thought, why not do this? And on top of that, it's not a substrate for MAO. So it's uh. orally active. And and there was even a, a sort of folk toxicological idea in the 1960s that the metabolic liberation of methanol from the dealkylation of the basic nitrogen could produce neurotoxic effects after consuming DMT. Really? I mean, this is not true, but this was a, a, a concern. Uh, yeah, so much of what we think about these drugs we take for granted now, but in the 1960s, not only was there fundamental uncertainty about the safety of LSD, there was about things like DMT as well. And um, to them, it was like this new dangerous synthetic stuff that people were making. They didn't think of it as... Um, so intimately linked to indigenous practices and a long history of use. And, and it's easy to say something like, oh, those methyl groups are metabolized into methanol. That's a neurotoxin and freak uh. people out. So then the claim was, okay, but DET is safe because that will produce ethanol instead of methanol, which is not as toxic. So DET uh. is the safer alternative to DMT. This is at least one source was making this claim. Um, so people had access to DET and it is a wonderful substance. It's a schedule one controlled substance. Now it's a darn shame that- What is it like? Um, it's sort of like LSD, I would say. Um, it's less- So more similar to LSD than DMT? Uh, the doses that I've tried, yeah. It has, I mean, I've never gotten as prominent visual effects from it. You know, Kerry Mullis synthesized DET and erased his own identity completely and it went into a sort of- almost dissociative fugue state for days and his friends had to reprogram him. He writes about this in his autobiography. Everyone right. always talks about the connection between LSD and the discovery of PCR. But before that, he had synthesized DET and erased his identity. What does that mean to erase your identity? He didn't know who he was. Oh my and God. he doesn't say how much he took either. It's almost like amnesia. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is what he describes. I've always wanted to track down because he describes the friends that helped him relearn who he was by reading him poetry that he loved. Um, 
And I've always wanted to hear that story from somebody else's perspective. But so DET. And, Inserted into psilocybin. Yeah, so, the... so DET never found in nature, although there is one scientific paper that claims that it was found in the venom of Bufo alvarius, but that is suspect and has never been reproduced. Anyway, and then when I contacted the authors to ask what was going on, they said, oh, I think that's a mistake. So, uh, but other than that, there's no indication whatsoever that this has ever been found in nature. The material is completely synthetic. Yoshengartz puts it into the substrate of the pcubensis that he's growing and finds that these mushrooms, instead of producing psilocin or psilocybin, are producing 4-hydroxy-DET, something that had never been found in a fungus previously. And so if his findings were real, this would suggest that you can, that there is a degree of promiscuity in the action of the tryptamine 4-hydroxylase enzyme, and you can put other stuff into the substrate and create all sorts of sort of semi-synthetic tryptamines using mycelium. And this was a really exciting idea that Shulgin speculated about, and it became a part of sort of psychedelic forum lore, where um, everyone would say like, yeah, yeah, what, what about that thing that Yoshin Garts did though? We, someone's got to do that again. And then people would kind of have to do it, but no one had access to analytical instruments. So nobody knew if it was really working. And so you'd get these kind of like half reports on the shroomery of people sort of, they, they'd take it and say, yeah, yeah, I think it feels different or whatever. So you never really knew what was going on. Then this religious group that was founded by a lawyer starts selling a compound that they're calling psilomethoxin that was already a known entity under the name 5-amino-4-hydroxy-DMT. And this is something that had been synthesized by a French chemist named Marc Julia, who is a really, really good chemist. Um, like one of the highest accomplishments you can have as a chemist is to have a reaction named after you. And Marc Julia has a reaction named after him, the Julia Olefination. So he was like, a, no slouch. This is a serious a serious dude, Mark Julia. And he was able to synthesize 5-amino-4-hydroxy-DMT via an extremely laborious convoluted route that nobody has ever been Recreated. able to, and people have, have, have actually now tried and nobody has ever been able Successful. to reproduce it. And one of the reasons for that is anytime you have a, a tryptamine that has a hydroxyl group in the four position like psilocin, it promotes polymerization of the molecule that that property that you see where a mushroom bruises blue or black or whatever is a product of psilocin forming oligomers and um and this is not a psilocin specific phenomenon in fact it actually happens more significantly with other four hydroxytryptamines that only have one substituent on the basic nitrogen or no substituents on the basic nitrogen. So this is just a, a chemical property. And to even call it degradation is uh, maybe like an anthropocentric, anthropocentric interpretation because maybe that's the whole point is forming these polymers. Maybe that serves some kind of protective effect for the fungus. But so this is one of many things that made this chemistry daunting and something that not even Shulgin wanted to reproduce. Uh. And the idea was kind of like, oh, what if we took advantage of that process that Yoshin Gartz described, where you dope the substrate with a synthetic material. If you were to follow Gartz's method, you would use 5-methoxytryptamine. But for whatever reason, this group used 5-MeO-DMT. Right. So, so Probably right because it's well-known and prominent and you know people know about it and... Like it creates I, a buzz. I, I guess, that's but you're also using a schedule one controlled substance unnecessarily. It's a right. very odd choice, especially if it's being done by a lawyer. So that right off the bat was uh, weird. Didn't quite make sense. Made it more expensive and more dangerous for them to do. Yeah. But I gave them the benefit of the doubt because as far as I know, it's possible that could work. Like if somebody gets it to work, it wouldn't blow my mind. Maybe, maybe there's some slight variation in the tryptamine 4-hydroxylase enzyme, different species, maybe liquid culture, maybe this, maybe that, maybe some kind of conditions could allow that transformation to take place. It seems within the realm of possibility to me that something like that could happen. And 
so when they reported it, I, yeah, I gave them the benefit of the doubt and I thought, huh, all right. And then you have all these reports, people saying it's different. I know it's different. It feels like a microdose at any dose. There's something very, very different about it. So I get the sample, I analyze it, and there's basically nothing in it. Mm. Um, nothing different about it compared to... Well, actually, there kind of was something different about it, which was that there was almost nothing in it. A normal psilocybin cubensis mushroom would have psilocin and psilocybin in it. This only had trace quantities. So if... if was they, it because it was just a very old sample or like could there be i don't have enough experience with mushroom analysis to say but i suspect gotcha. that was okay. not the case um okay. i suspect that if the 5-meo-dmt was truly being included and it did exert any effect it may have even been suppressing biosynthesis of psilocin and psilocybin mm, interesting maybe Okay. Um, because I think this was also reported by Alexander Sherwood that the, the concentrations were extremely low, if I remember correctly. I'd have to double check that. And you did this independent from USONA, and USONA also carried out yeah, their and, own and research. Long, on and it, long right? before, and didn't publish it. Uh, but what I did uh, instead was I contacted Ian directly yeah. and told him what I had found. Right. And, um, and I said, you know, this is... Uh, this does not appear to have worked. Right. I could have made a mistake. I don't have an analytical reference of 5-MeO4-Hydroxy-DMT. Maybe the mass spec didn't pick it up, but based on, and I used two different mass specs, based on the analysis that I did, it did not look like it was there. And I think that maybe there was some wishful thinking at play because I know that he then started saying, well, nobody has an analytical reference, which was true, but I think he... You're a reputable chemist with a, with a pretty solid track record. I mean, Well, I mean, I'm not, I'm, no, I'm not making any kind of claim that what I did was definitive, but it should have been taken into account. For sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, especially because actually extraction of psilocin from anything is non-trivial because it's very it doesn't like to partition from any aqueous layer into a non-polar solvent because it's almost always charged at any ph so there actually are complexities with analysis of those sorts of molecules that need to be acknowledged but yeah so anyway and then it kept going and then and then Alexander Sherwood actually published, maybe someone else actually, there may have been some intermediate mm. person that published something, I can't remember, but Alexander Sherwood was the first person to publish a peer-reviewed analysis and found the same thing that I did. And then there was a kind of outcry and, and the group was suggesting that Sherwood's affiliation with USONA represented a pharmaceutical company trying to suppress a alternative medicine or something like that and it, it seemed to sort of conspiracy theory yeah, yeah it seemed to enter a sort of um undignified space pretty quickly i mean in reality i don't think any of this is of tremendous consequence it's more a good story than anything else like how many people actually use this nobody you know maybe at absolute most i tried microdosing it once at a what it would normally be a, a dose that would impact me yeah. I would feel it a little bit. I felt nothing. There was really no no effect yeah. uh, in taking it. And I didn't try anything beyond that because it didn't, it never really resonated in a way. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, you know, I, I don't think it represents some kind of a, a disaster at all. It's kind of funny the way like we talk about these things because it's a good story. Whereas somebody going to prison or something like that, it's not really a good story. It's just taken for granted, but it's actually like a far, far, far worse thing than right. somebody kind of slightly fudging the uh, getting engaged in some unfortunate self-deception right so you've had some transitions in the last probably two three years you know you became well known for hamilton's pharmacopoeia on vice um and the last couple of years you've really turned back to focusing a lot of your time and energy on chemistry yeah um and so i'm curious like what what is it that you do in the lab let's say that's different from or similar to this process that you just described to us what what are you doing when it comes or how are you inventing these new psychedelic analogs why what does that look like um and 
and you know, in reference to the last story, this was a lot of wishful thinking. What what's the test of um, efficacy you use to figure out if a substance is worthwhile in pursuing or amplifying or understanding more? Well, I think that when it comes to things like depression, there are a number of different tests that exist, but their value in terms of predicting efficacy is pretty limited. I mean, the most well-known example is forced swim, where you take a rodent and you drop it into a cylinder of water and you time how long it will tread water before succumbing to exhaustion. And this is used to this day, despite the fact that almost everybody knows that it is at best flawed, if not completely useless, if not worse than useless, actually a, a source of totally meaningless information that's a distraction. Um, and you've got that. And then you have people debating about various biomarkers and you know anyone that closely follows the literature on the antidepressant mechanism of ketamine will be aware that it is all the fuck over the place. Like it is just so all over the place that it almost promotes a philosophical question about the validity of these investigations. You know, for By all over the place, you mean some of the data shows very positive outcomes, some of the data shows very negative, like there's a ton of variability in the data that they're finding? Or? In everything. I mean, the, maybe the most prominent example would be that one dominant hypothesis of the mechanism involved ketamine's activation of mTOR signaling. Mm. And then it came out that rapamycin, which inhibits mTOR signaling, increase the antidepressant efficacy of ketamine. Mm. Like the complete opposite of what would be expected based on all previous work. Mm. And what does that say? I don't really know other than take all of this with a grain of salt because it is changing so quickly and is so all over the place. And people always are sort of posturing as if they know what's going on. They're like, oh, it opened the the critical learning window. It's the default mode network. It's track B, it's mTOR. I was just going to ask you about track B because yeah. that's the new, that's yeah. the new mechanism It'll of action. It'll always be a new thing. About, right? It'll always be the new thing. The salience and network, the, there's, yeah, there's... Dendritic remodeling, spinogenesis, whatever. And I'm not to say that these things don't exist or that they don't play some role, but I think that if there's any lesson to be learned from monitoring this literature over the last 50 years is that it's constantly evolving and people don't even really care about this stuff. Like when you actually go to an event like this and you talk to people, you quickly realize that these neuroscientific frameworks for conceptualizing the action of drugs are almost like personal mythologies that they create that have nothing to do with neuroscience. So they're talking about the default mode network and the default mode network is the ego and it's about destroying the ego or the critical learning period is you've got to, you know, use this moment, this opportunity that the psychedelic gives you to learn new skills. And like, it, there's this kind of, um, this kind of strange way of talking about it that has, if anything, just increased my appreciation of Alexander Shulgin and how much emphasis he put on the value of experience mm. as did Terrence McKenna, mm. the supreme value of, of direct experience as the ultimate measure and the most sophisticated high resolution tool for the analysis of these drugs. And that's, that's powerful. It's extremely powerful. And at the end of the day, it's the only thing that really matters. I mean, this is something that I, I talked about today where if I injected five chinchillas with a drug and tabulated how much they twitch their heads, people would say, that's a very scientific study that you did. But if I were to take that same drug myself, people would say, oh, that's not very scientific. Well, our understanding of science is skewed by industrialism in a way, right? And, and sort of the emphasis on, on the mechanistic or the emphasis on the, uh, how do we reduce this as much as possible? 
and, and ideas of reproducibility and objectivity, both of which are valid. But if you go so far down this road of valuing reproducibility and objectivity over the production of meaningful information, then who cares? Like you have this highly reproducible, highly objective bullshit that that's irrelevant. That's completely irrelevant. Right. Um, I mean, that's not always the case. It's like it, some of this animal stuff actually is valuable. Like head twitch really does have very robust predictive value in terms of, um, in terms of predicting the psychedelic activity in humans. So it's not all bullshit, but, um, and, and conceivably it could be better. You know, there could be all sorts of weird things that have changed. One example would be the just uh, extreme dominance of mice in scientific research. And that wasn't always the case. There actually used to be more animal diversity in scientific research. Mm. And that gradually changed. I mean, it used to, if you look at papers from the fifties and sixties, it was not that unusual to see other things, to see chickens occasionally. Monkeys. Monkeys. I mean, you still see monkeys, but, but that's just, that's more of a price thing. But yeah, I, I feel like maybe, you know, maybe the animal models are not as good as they could be. Maybe any number of things, but um, I can't even remember where, how we got on this. So how does this then inform the research that you're carrying out or the, the chemistry work that you're carrying out? And uh, maybe as like an add on to this, I was talking with Dylan DiNardo, you know, Dylan yeah, yeah, he's cool, runs yeah. mind state design. Yeah. Yeah. And so we got into this about large language models, how artificial intelligence can potentially help us to better understand through qualitative research the subjective effects of these various substances, which will then help to inform the language that we create around it. So we, we feel, because part of the, the limitation with understanding these substances is the language that we use to talk about them and discuss them. It's not, uh, we don't have a vocabulary that's rich enough which is where the default mode network and these, the neuroscience is making a lot of progress. And what I'm hearing from you is we need a richer vocabulary that speaks from the subjective experience, not just the purely mechanistic, and obje mechanistic objective experience. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I think, I mean, I think that if people took their own experiences a little bit more seriously, it could be tremendously valuable. Like I was interviewing on my podcast, a, um, a chemist named Thomas Monroe recently. And he has always been a champion of Daniel Siebert. I don't know if you're... I've heard of Daniel Siebert. Yeah, he doesn't get really get Sal talked about. Salvia? Right? Yeah, yeah. He doesn't really get talked about, but he's kind of the guy who definitively established Salvinorin A as the psychoactive principle of Salvia Divinorum and established how potent it was and in collaboration with Brian Roth established that it was... When was this? In the 90s? Yeah. And, um, and he did all this by himself as a citizen scientist with no funding, no resources, and did it through careful, simple experimentation that was done thoughtfully. And that is also the case for Jonathan Ott's discovery of the psychoactivity of bufotenine. To this day, to this day, there is debate about the psychoactivity of bufotenine. At the time that Jonathan Ott was doing those experiments, there were many people who genuinely believed that bufotenine was not a psychedelic. They thought hmm. it was just a poison. And so he was able to solve that mystery very easily by extracting and purifying bufotenine from anadenanthra colubrina. And is that Yopo or is that the toad venom? It's Sibyl. What's that? Anadenanthra colubrina. What's that? It's the seed of a South American tree. And that's what's in Yopo when they... Yopo might be Anadenanthra peregrina. I'm not okay. totally sure. Okay. Which, yeah. which has a, a little bit... Anadenanthra colubrina is almost pure bufotenine, if not pure bufotenine, in very, very high concentrations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's easy to extract and purify bufotenine from Anadenanthra colubrina. And it's used as a snuff? It's used as a snuff, also in um, like a traditional chicha drink. Okay. It's also smoked. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is in Colombia, Brazil, Argentina, Argentina. Yeah. Interesting. This is a big, I mean, and, and really throughout a lot of South America. And it's funny because everyone is so interested in the Eleusinian mysteries and Mesoamerican mushroom rituals and ancient ayahuasca and morning glories, but no one seems to care about Bufotinian, which is really firmly established to be the use of these seeds is 
in terms of evidence, the strongest and oldest evidence of human psychedelic drug use. By far, like the, there is slightly older stuff, but it's more cryptic in its meaning. Like there's peyote effigies that have been found um, along the Rio Grande that... I think are 15,000 years old. They're very, very old, but they are not... I mean, I, I think we probably agree that they're probably an indication that peyote was being used as a drug but um, or a sacrament or whatever. But the evidence for ancient use of bufotenine containing seeds is pipes that have the residue right. remaining in them. It's, there's no uncertainty whatsoever. It is completely clear that people were using anadenanthra seeds in snuffs, in smoking preparations, and in enema preparations. In enema South, preparations? Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Boofing bufotenine. Have you ever boofed bufotenine? I've never boofed it, no. I've snorted it. What was the experience like? It is both chemically and qualitatively almost perfectly intermediate between 5-MeO-DMT and DMT. Interesting. Yeah, so it's more visual than 5-MeO-DMT, less visual than DMT, um, more dissociative than DMT, less dissociative than 5-MeO-DMT, more nauseating than either of them. Okay. Has a, a slightly longer duration than either of them, interestingly, which is sort of unanticipated. It's about the same potency as DMT by weight, maybe slightly less potent, but about the same. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting that nobody talks about bufotenine because it is not only a classical psychedelic, it is truly the one with the richest history of archaeological evidence for human use. Like, there is a lot of evidence. This is, this is not this like This is something one, you rarely hear about. This yeah. is something I rarely hear about. Yeah, because, because, okay, so this all goes back. Because there's still, for whatever reason, fundamental debate about whether or not this drug is psychedelic when I can assure you from personal experience, it is psychedelic. And if you look, I'm not the only one. Many other people have tried it, have confirmed that it's psychedelic. And Jonathan Ott wrote this brilliant paper where he carefully conducted a series of bioassays via different routes of administration of bufotenine and definitively established through his own self-experiments using very low-tech techniques that this is a drug. He solved the mystery. All it took was one careful, thoughtful guy extracting and crystallizing an alkaloid and trying it a variety of different ways to establish that it is in fact a psychedelic. And this has enormous ramifications for the discipline of archaeology, for understanding the history of psychoactive plants. And mm -hmm. it just took one person mm -hmm. doing a study that probably cost like a thousand dollars at most. How is this? What's, what's your take on the immortality key? And this sort of Christian Greek lineage... I mean, we know about Kukion. We know how it was used in the Eleusinian Mysteries. Do you think psychedelic plant medicines were used by early Christians? When that, when that came out, what were, your, what were some of your thoughts and impressions? I, I read it. I hung out with Brian. I think he's smart and, Brian's sharp, yeah. and interesting. My take on it is, first of all, I lack sufficient expertise in that area to really definitively have a meaningful take on the matter. But what I do know is that I have spent an enormous portion of my adult life trying to decipher drug practices from the 1970s and 1980s. Interesting. And it is almost impossible to figure out things that people were doing in the 1970s and 1980s in the United States. Interesting. And so when people talk about the practices of long since disappeared cultures thousands of years ago in other parts of the world, I just feel like I have no chance whatsoever of meaningfully interpreting anything about what they were doing. Mm. If I can't figure out what somebody was doing in California in 1977, how am I going to know what they were doing in ancient Greece over 2,000 years ago? So then what makes the Bufotine archaeological evidence that much more compelling? Because if you find a pipe with drug residue in it, okay. that seems, I mean, I don't know. 
there, there aren't that many other ways to interpret a pipe with drug residue in the bowl. Um, maybe the pipe was actually a drug holder and they were just like to hold it in their hand, but they weren't smoking it. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. The, you know, it's, it's pretty, the evidence is pretty damn strong. Right. Snuff trays, implements for snorting the powder, uh, ceremonial cloth headbands, it seems. Um, I mean, they're almost certainly snuffing implements. They are often bifurcated so that you can, you know, get both nostrils or they have some kind of... I mean, they're, it's, like almost like rape, like a... Yeah, like yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, and the enema tubes also. Oh, wow, they found the enema tubes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And a lot of them. Not like one, but hundreds. Huh. Yeah. So... Um, that is why the now, physical evidence it's much more significant and sufficient in yeah the, in this case yeah. yeah yeah if there were you know recipes of the kukion that showed exactly how it was being prepared with descriptions of the visionary effects or something like that um the, the, my main actually my main hesitation with this is that something like what i just described with Bufotinine containing snuffs has never been done with ergot wine preparations, mm. um, with the exception maybe of the supposed ergot wine preparation made by Gordon Todd Skinner described in Crystal Cole's book, Lysergic. Lysergic. Uh, Lysergic. Highly Lysergic. recommend Lysergic. Okay. Yeah. Is it on Amazon or do you have to go on like Abe Books or one of those sort of... I think you can still grab a copy on Amazon. Okay. All right. That's a real classic. Okay. Yeah. Um, she describes Gordon Todd Skinner making a traditional ergot wine that produced a, a powerful psychedelic effect. But this was Gordon Todd Skinner, who is a compulsive liar and a psychopath who may have just put LSD in some wine and lied to everyone very easily. So who's to say what that was? Uh, and he doesn't respond to my messages in prison. So. What a lie. <laughs> <laughs> who was Dale Pendell? He was a guy who wrote these beautiful poetic books. He had um, he had amazing eyebrows that were like very um, sculptural and pointed. And I think he was one of the first people to report on the effect of xenon. Mm. Actually, yeah, I mean, he's famous for these three books that he published that. Um, I think they came out in the 90s and had a... Early 2000s early, as well, oh, yeah. early 2000s, yeah. yeah. And they had a, a real cult following. I, I never interacted with him, um, but I appreciated what he did. Did you ever read the books? Yeah, I read parts of them. I read his um, Xenon report, and I read his poem about Bufo Alvarius Venom, I believe. It's been years. I actually haven't cracked those books in a long time. I um I found out about them seven years ago from your conference nemesis. Uh, he used to be a we used to be close, and oh, he okay. gave me a list of books yeah. to read, and that was one of them. And I didn't read it for years; I just kept it on the shelf. And I opened up this is from Akonosis, the third one. And so I opened it up a couple of years ago and read through it, and was, I mean, the prose, the balance, the pharmacology, the science, the history. It's a very comprehensive. Uh, and well written and there's these beautiful essays as well about like talking sticks and the two dragon problem and a few other things that we have a training program for facilitators and i'm now requiring that as reading because initially it was like go read guy like we have these guides on third wave about the different substances lsd and mushrooms and ayahuasca and a lot of coaches they like to know about what are the different substances in medicine so instead of having them read even something like how to change your mind, it felt like pharmacognosis was still reasonably accessible while having a lot of great contextual information presented in a, I think, beautiful and, and somewhat compelling way. Yeah. Yeah, I should, yeah, I should re- I think it's like kind of like a, not a lot of people know about it, but it's a really uh, incredible book. So anyway, yeah, I just wanted to get your take on it because- you've been around in this space and because of your, especially with what you've done with Hamilton's pharmacopoeia, you've explored so many substances. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to that. What were your three favorite episodes of Hamilton's pharmacopoeia? 
I th- well, I enjoyed different ones for different reasons. The episode with Steve Gill, which was the MDMA episode, has a certain emotional resonance for me because Steve Gill was a uh, just a kind of forgotten soul who had spent his life making MDMA and doing actual scientific research as well in a sort of Shulgin-like lab. He, he was a lot like Shulgin if Shulgin did things a little differently. If maybe if he didn't stay in school and he sold MDMA and he didn't publish his findings in scientific journals, but the brilliance and the enthusiasm was there every bit as much as it was with Shulgin. And, um, and he, it was people like him really as much as Shulgin that allowed our world to appreciate MDMA because you know, a big part of appreciating a drug is having the opportunity to try it. I think maybe one of the reasons nobody's talking about bufotenine is nobody's tried it. Right. And so the fact that so many people got to use MDMA in the 80s and 90s was a product of people like Steve Gill who risked their freedom to make that drug available. And he was somebody that really would have been forgotten, I think, if I didn't have the opportunity to film that episode. And so those were the pieces that felt best to me where, you know, there's lots of things that I really enjoy filming. Like it was, I think, very beautiful and amazing going to Gabon and filming the Buiti Iboga rituals. And I would like to think that I had a somewhat novel take on it by integrating this discussion of the natural synthetic dichotomy with the discovery of the supposed tramadol containing plant. And, but the reality is that lots of people have filmed iboga ceremonies and lots of people can bring a camera to an iboga ceremony and capture beautiful footage of the dancing and the music. And so I'm not the only person that can do that or has done that. Whereas some of these projects, I genuinely feel if I hadn't done them, nobody ever would have, and the stories would have been lost completely. Mm, mm. And so there's a certain, that that was really what my priority was a lot of the time and why I was drawn to a lot of these more obscure subjects. And one reason I also never emphasized medicalization in any major way was I thought, there's a lot of people that are gonna do a thing about veterans taking MDMA. Right. Like, I'm, like I don't need to be that guy. I'll let someone else do that story. I want to tell a story about Daryl Lemaire and him making five ethoxy phenethylamines in a volcano. And that's just a... Who was Darren Lemaire? He was like Shulgin's silent partner, who, mm. who again, I mean, this comes back to this idea that Shulgin invented the drugs, but when it came to distributing them, he didn't want to have anything to do with it um. for the most part, with very few exceptions. Um, it just represented too much of a liability. And for him... But someone has to make the drugs. Right. And Daryl Lemaire, like Steve Gill, was another one of these people who was engaged in the large scale manufacture of MDMA, MDA, and some 2C phenethylamines. Yeah. Yeah. So then that. And how did, I mean, what's the volcano story? Well, uh, like, well it was this it was the, um, the finale of the first season of my show, they, uh, I had been given, there's this wonderful woman named Tanya Manning who lived with the Shulgans throughout their lives and really uh, cared for Anne and Sasha Shulgan and was really vital to their happiness and well-being at the end of both of their lives. And she also developed a really strong understanding of their archives. You know, there's a couple of people that spend a lot of time there and developed an understanding of the archives. The other one, of course, would be Keeper Trout. And they um, know a lot of things that are not widely known about the Shulgans. And so they were digitizing things. And she said, you know, I've got these letters and I think you'd find them interesting and it would be helpful for us if you digitize them. Are you interested? And so she, I can't even totally remember why it was that she initially thought that I would be interested maybe because i was working on a paper about 2cb or something i can't remember exactly but she gives them to me and it's correspondence between 
Shulgin and this mysterious chemist named Daryl Lemaire. Uh, and, and I was thinking, wow, this, these letters are incredible. This is a whole chapter of psychedelic history I didn't know anything about. Who is this Daryl Lemaire? Then I start to realize that Daryl Lemaire under the under two tiers of pseudonyms, the first was Lazar and then Hostin Nez had written this interesting book about use of various 2CD variants as nootropics, which I'd read years ago. And I, and I started putting it all together. And I thought, oh, wow, Daryl Lemaire is the guy that wrote the 2CD smart drugs book. And then as I kept looking into him, I started realizing, and and his story is really strange. Like he he, there's this phenomenon where um, mercury absorbs ultraviolet light, hmm. and there is a mineral called willemite that actually like a synthetic version of willemite is used on thin layer chromatography plates. If you've ever seen one, they glow green, and it's because they're impregnated with the same type of mineral, basically, and um, Daryl Lemaire had observed that if you look at mercury, it looks like a liquid, but it actually is existing in the vapor phase, but it's invisible. This is the real danger of mercury is inhaling the vapor, which is invisible. Um, just like having it on a tabletop or even touching it with your skin, assuming that you don't have a cut in your skin is not necessarily so dangerous. Mm. Um, and you can visualize that vapor by putting the mercury in front of a willemite screen and then shining ultraviolet light on it. And mm. then because the vapor is absorbing the ultraviolet light, it creates a, a, a black vaporous shadow that you can suddenly see. So Daryl Lemaire saw that mercury would co-occur with gold and created this device for using this UV blocking effect of mercury vapor to help gold prospectors find gold and made a huge amount of money off of this weird device in like the 1950s, retired when he was young, bought a volcano and built a... Where, where, where? In Reno. In Reno, Nevada? Yeah. There's a volcano in Reno? Or a, um, it might technically be like a cinder cone or okay, something like okay, that yeah, or some... Yeah. That, that might be like not quite volcanologically accurate, something volcano like. And and then blasted out the center of the volcano with dynamite and built a psychedelic drug lab in the center of the volcano. And um and then on top of that, I had started, I can't even remember how I made this second connection that he had been a sort of mentor to Casey Hardison as well mm. at the end of his life. Mm. And then I started thinking, wow, this is a crazy story mm. that nobody knows anything about this guy, Daryl Lemaire. There's barely anything written about him. And so I made uh, a piece about Daryl Lemaire. It was called the Lazy Lizard School of Hedonism. And that was the yeah, finale of the first season. And again, this was an example of one of these stories that I feel if I hadn't told it, nobody would have it would have just been lost mm. and there's a lot of that in psychedelic history i mean it's there's a lot of weirdos that are attracted to this area who do strange and exciting things and a lot of good stories and that's for me that's been one of the major attractions is almost psychedelics aside there's just some crazy stories like the one we started with yeah yeah there's some yeah yeah medicalization is very important you know why is fda approval important why is why you know first like, and foremost i wish it weren't important i wish that fda approval were not the be all end all but we live in such a complicated society where there's so many different factors that need to be balanced right if you say like to hell with regulation this is all benefiting corporate interests people should be able to do whatever they want, which is certainly a tendency that I have to lean in that direction. But then you still end up with potentially the same problems, but with no safety net in place because anybody can sell anything with no regulation. They can make whatever claims they want. And so total deregulation also introduces certain types of risks. And I think people want a ultra simplistic version of all of this. They want to oversimplify things. And I've, I get it. I've actually contributed to the problem in terms of my own 
journalism, not my own journalism in, ter uh, in terms of my show, but I also was a producer and correspondent on Vice's show on HBO, the news show. Mm -hmm. And those were things that I did not write for the most part. I wrote maybe one of them, mm -hmm. but they were usually um, other producers that I was collaborating with. And working on those stories really gave me a inside view of how the news is constructed to promote certain viewpoints that are not necessarily true or that they are oversimplifying very complicated phenomena. Like I was working with this producer who I like a lot and I respect as a, a person and filmmaker named Eric Weinreb who had spent a good bit of his career working for Michael Moore. And, you know, I think Michael Moore is a, a brilliant propagandist and I agree with virtual with most of what he says. So it, for me, it's not so grating to hear somebody who's like, you know, creating like pro union propaganda because I'm in favor of unions. I think that's great. Like I agree with pretty much everything that he wants. So it doesn't have the same, effect on me, but at the same time, you have to recognize these manipulations, even if they're manipulations that you agree with that serve your interests. Right. And so I was working on stories that kind of were like that, where, for example, I worked on this one piece called White Collar Weed, and the story was very simple. You have the sympathetic mom and pop weed growers. They they are, they've sacrificed their freedom. They've worked hard for what they believe in. And then you've got these diabolical Yale educated carpetbaggers who are coming to set up the first cannabis monopoly and the viewer is sympathetic to the struggling mom and pop growers. And they don't like that evil man who studied money at Yale. And, and so, you know, you set up this kind of simple moral dichotomy where there's good guys and bad guys, but that isn't real because the evil Yale businessman who I profiled, who was the owner of a company called Tilray, wasn't actually evil. And Tilray did not become a monopoly. And the problem that the mom and pop growers had was not caused by this Canadian businessman at all. Their problem was prohibition. And so a viewer looks at this and they don't, and they're, they've been emotionally manipulated to believe that the business of cannabis is bad for the mom and pop grower, but that case has not really been made. It's just a kind of nebulous emotional appeal to that can actually distract people from real issues, which in this case is prohibition, which was actually what was threatening the mom and pop growers in addition to more complicated market concerns like the oversaturation of the cannabis market, which resulted in some people just abandoning their crops at some points because they couldn't make any money off of it. That wasn't caused by Canadian businessmen. That was caused by much bigger market factors. Anyway, so... You know, I, I've worked on a couple things like that and I see how it's done and I see how it impacts people. And um, it more than anything concerns me that people can get distracted from what really matters, which is fighting for their own freedom and doing everything in their power to prevent prohibition and the DEA from becoming more powerful than they already are. Yeah, it's like a rising tide lifts all boats that... I mean, even one of the teachings of, and I won't get too sort of preaching here, but one of the teachings of psychedelics is interconnectedness, uh, coming together, uh, you know, like working collaboratively. I think collaboration is great. And so I think there is something to be said for facilitators who are out of integrity or providers or shamans who are out of integrity. I think the same thing can be said about certain, um, you know, businesses within a hype cycle. Who are maybe doing things that, let's say, Field Trip, for example, who raised a hundred million dollars and kind of went up in smoke, and yet there are people who are doing great and important work that are going to push this forward in a significant way. And I think Atai is one of those companies. I think Compass Pathways is one of those companies. I think Cybin, which I'm an advisor to, is one of those companies. They're doing good research and they have good teams, and I think it's going to help with the widespread accessibility of psychedelics for all. 
whether it's deep room, safe, or but you know, FDAs. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's and you know, we're in a transitional period. A lot is going to change. The current projection is that psilocybin is not going to be approved until 2027. There's going to be a lot of time and a lot of work and a lot of changes that are going to take place in the intervening years. And I think it's important as much as possible for people to try to be constructive and less reactionary because that is, that's what the man wants. The man wants you, they want you fucking attacking each other. Wow. So that was an hour. Thank you. I learned so much from you today. The nuance that you brought to the conversation, uh, the particularity about DET and bufotenine. Bufotenine, yeah. Bufotenine. I mean, that's so fascinating. So I just, yeah, I appreciate your commitment and devotion to your work as a chemist and an innovator and an educator. You know, you've educated millions about drugs generally, but also psychedelics. So I just want to share my appreciation for uh, all of that, which you've done in the last 10, 12 years in the space. I think it's really moved the space forward in a substantial way. And you've made a lot of incredible contributions to both psychedelics and also uh, drugs in general. Thank you. I appreciate that. I enjoyed the conversation. Hey listeners, Paul here. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with the brilliant Hamilton Morris. If you got something from this conversation, please consider sharing it with a friend who might also benefit from it. You can also follow the link in the description to go deeper into this episode with full show notes, transcript, and any links that we mentioned today. And finally, we have a free private community at community.thethirdwave.co. Check it out, log in, join, introduce yourself, and we have a little area there, a space is what they call it, where you can dive in deeper on this episode if you want to get into some rich discussion around it. All right, that's it for now. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to grow your own medicine for microdosing or high dose experiences, check out our mushroom grow kit. It's the simplest way to get a reliable source of high quality mushrooms, and it includes detailed videos walking you through the entire process. No guessing, just clear instructions for best results. Check out the link in the description below.